in the news this Wednesday. Ryan White, the young man who became a national symbol for AIDS sufferers, was buried in Indiana, and Israel's Labor Party leader, Shimon Peres, failed to form a new government. We'll have the details in our news summary in a moment. Robin? After the news summary, we'll discuss how France got three of its hostages released and what that means for American hostages. Two hostage experts, former State Department official Paul Bremer and analyst Brian Jenkins, will join us. Next, Roger Mudd reports on the latest attempt to ban assault weapons. And finally, part two of Charlene Hunter Galt's special series on Americans who've fallen through the safety net. Tonight, Hispanic dropouts. President Gorbachev had his most alarming words yet about secession for Soviet's republics. In a speech broadcast today on Soviet television, Gorbachev said, if we begin to divide up, I'll give it to you bluntly. We'll end up in such a civil war, in such bloody carnage, that we won't be able to crawl out of it. The U.S. today rejected a Soviet proposal to allow a united Germany membership in both NATO and the Warsaw Pact. The proposal was made by Soviet Foreign Minister Shevard Nazi. White House spokesman Fitzwater said it was just another formula to make Germany neutral. This is the day Israel was supposed to get its new government, but it didn't happen. Labor Party leader Shimon Peres' deal fell apart at the last minute. He went to Parliament with the support of just enough members to form a coalition, but right before the session, two members of a small religious party backed out. An angry debate followed after Perez told the Parliament he could not deliver a coalition. He asked for more time. He was given two weeks. The government fell apart last month because of differences over the U.S. peace plan for talks with the Palestinians. Paris supports those talks. In Colombia today, a car bomb exploded near a police patrol in the cocaine trafficking center of Medellin, killing at least eight police officers and six civilians. There was no immediate claim of responsibility. But drug traffickers have killed 20 police officers in Medellin this month in trying to force the government to stop extraditing drug suspects to the United States. France today denied it made a deal to get some of its hostages freed. Yesterday, a French woman, her Belgian boyfriend, and their child were released by the Palestinian group that kidnapped them aboard their yacht in the Mediterranean two and a half years ago. The release followed an appeal from Libya's leader, Muammar Gaddafi, and came a month after France delivered three fighter jets to Libya. French Defense Minister today denied there was a connection. We'll have more on this story right after the news summary. That's our news summary. Now it's on to how France got hostages released, Roger Mudd on assault weapons, and part two of Charlene Hunter God's series, Through the Safety Net. We focus first tonight on the release of three French hostages yesterday and what price, if any, France had to pay. The hostages had been held by the Revolutionary Council of Fatah, a radical Palestinian group based in Leb Lebanon with ties to Libya. The release came a month after France returned to Libya three French-built warplanes it had seized. With us to discuss the hostage release are Brian Jenkins, the managing director of Kroll International, which advises corporations on counterterrorism, and Paul Bremer, until 1989, the State Department's ambassador at large for counterterrorism. He currently is a consultant at Kissinger Associates, an international consulting firm. Mr. Bremer, the British press today attacks France, saying it traded jets for hostages and for hypocrisy, in the words of many British newspapers, in thanking Muammar Gaddafi for the release. Does France deserve the criticism, do you think? I think they do. I think it's at a minimum fairly unseemly to thank Gaddafi for noble and humanitarian gestures. It's rather like uh, being mugged, having a mugger come up to you and stick a gun in your back and saying, I'll let you go free if you give me your wallet, and you give him your wallet and he lets you go and you thank him for his noble and humanitarian gesture. It's, it, you know, it's extortion. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, do you believe that France deserves this criticism? Well, I, I, I think really that the issue goes beyond the trading of hostages. I'm not, I'm not here to defend uh, French foreign policy nor certainly to defend uh, uh, Mr. Gaddafi. Uh, but the French, the, the French issue, the, the French objectives went far beyond the, the specific issue of hostages. The, uh, France, for its own reason, wanted to improve relations with Libya, 
Uh, France has historic interests in North Africa. It has what it regards as commitments to uh, countries in the region that were formerly French colonies or French protectorates like uh, Chad in Tunisia. And the issue of the return of the aircraft is only one piece of what has been a recent French effort to reestablish influence in the, in the Arab world. So you think it's unfair to say that France traded jets for hostages? Well, I, it, it is difficult. I have no basis for, for knowing uh, how much that was part of an explicit deal, uh, whether, whether France, in the course of attempting to improve relations, said, look, we will return these jets, which in fact uh, uh, were Qaddafi's to begin with and, and, and went to France for repairs in 1985, and then were, were held there in 1986, uh, so it's not as if France has, has sold them new jets. Um, it, it, but it's hard to say how much it was part of an explicit deal or just part of an overall process to improve diplomatic relations. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bremer, does this um, solution of France's problem, because that is, those three were the last French hostages held in the, uh, in the Middle East, does it have any bearing on the fate of U.S. and other Western hostages in Lebanon? Well, it could. It could very well complicate the uh, uh, release of our hostages because it sets the precedent that a country uh, does things, in effect giving in to terrorist extortion, which make it harder for us to get our hostages out with al without also doing that. And I think you can see that in the reaction of the Abu Nidal group, the terrorist group which sees these, has now gone on to say, now we want to get the terrorists in Belgium released in exchange for the exist existing Belgian hostages. So. Part, Whatever, of the, part of the same Part family. of the same group. I mean, it's quite clear that however we may sophisticated analysis we may make about it, the way the terrorists see it is that there was a deal made and they're ready for the next deal. Yeah. Now, the one they want released is just about to finish a 10-year prison term in Belgium when he would normally be uh, eligible for pardon. Suppose the Belgian government, which has been negotiating with Abu Didal, suppose when he's up for, for pardon, pardons him, they, he goes back, and then they release the Belgian terrorists. Would the U.S. regard that as a deal? It would depend a lot on exactly how it happened. I think in the, Bel the case of the Belgian, the fellow they want out, uh, we should remember, is a murderer. He, he attacked a synagogue. He killed, 20, uh, killed one person and wounded 20 others. He, he killed innocent people. Uh, it is true he's eligible for parole after 10 years, and if, normal, if the Belgians follow a normal judicial procedure, whatever that is in Belgium, then I think you have less grounds to complain that there was an explicit deal made. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, do you agree with Mr. Bremer that uh, in the sense that this puts a price on, uh, up for hostages, the way Abu Nidal has reacted to it, that it does affect the other Western hostages in the Middle East? I think there always has been a price put on the hostages. I don't know that this deal uh, uh, necessarily affects that price one way or the other. Uh, the fact is that those holding the other, Western, uh, the other Westerners uh, captive in Lebanon have made a variety of demands over the six and seven years that they have held hostages. Some of those hostages uh, have now been there going into their sixth year. Um, I, in, in, in the Middle East, I think uh, certainly the captors always had in their mind that they would get something in return for those hostages. It may not be what they demand initially. It, it may not be uh, something that is necessarily paid by the United States or by another Western government. It may be something they get instead from their patrons in Tehran, but they certainly do expect something in return for the release of those hostages. That has always been the case. So this isn't new. Well, it's not the question that they've put a price on it. The problem is that the price was paid. The issue isn't that so they you, wanted So you don't have any doubt that the French paid a price? I think it's clear from what happened here. The French agreed to send back the mirages and in effect broke the European community's policy of sanction on Libya. I agree with Brian that they had broader objectives. The problem is they've subordinated the obje common objective of fighting terrorism to their national objectives in North Africa. Back on the American and other Western hostages, some uh, are commenting that this doesn't have any bearing because these were, in effect, under the control of Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, that he could tell Abu Nidal, yes, release them now, whereas that doesn't apply to any of the hostages, uh, the Americans, for instance. That are I, there, I think there is some truth in that. There, the structure of the problem is different. Um, um, but it can have the effect of, of, in effect, saying that terrorism pays, that hostage holding pays, which is the real problem. Uh, it isn't exactly the same. The, the situation in Lebanon is considerably more complicated. 
Well, in that connection, the Tehran Times, the uh, newspaper that's thought to be very close to the thinking of President Rafsanjani, said uh, in reaction to this today, this should signal that hostage taking should end, that it contradicts Islamic, um, Islamic teachings. Is that a new step in the Iranian, that attempt of those Iranians to move the situation on? It's hard to tell. I think anyone who uh, can tell you exactly what's going on in Tehran uh, is a lot better informed than I am. It's a welcome sign whenever anybody in Tehran says that. Whether it will lead to something and a break on our situation, I think, remains to be seen. We've been up this hill many times before with the Iranians. How do you feel about that, Mr. Jenkins, what the Tehran Times said today? Well, there have been some, some more positive comments coming out of Tehran recently, and I agree with Ambassador Bremer. I, it, it would be perilous to try to predict what, in fact, uh, is on the minds of the Iranians. What, what appears to be, and I un I'm underline the word appear, uh, what appears to be a, a new development is that uh, there is now apparently somewhat more of a consensus in Tehran uh, that the economic situation of the, re uh, of the country requires uh, investment, trade, better relations with the West, and that some resolution to the hostage crisis in Lebanon is a prerequisite to better relations with the West, and therefore uh, Tehran better get a move on to exercise what influence it may have uh, to bring about the release of those hostages. Previously there were people that held that position, but there also were probably to a certain extent still are those that regard any improvement in relations with the West uh, as a betrayal of the Islamic Revolution and therefore welcome the continued captivity of the hostages. Mr. Jenkins, um, come back to the uh, American stand on this and what the French um, uh, behavior teaches us, um, negatively or positively. What, what do you say is the moral position of the French today, leaving sort of geopolitics and so on aside, just morally speaking? Well, I th the, French, the French actually would probably re reject the, uh, uh, putting the argument in moral terms. They tend to see terrorism as, as much more a practical issue. They tend to see uh, it not in terms as we do as a global struggle against terrorism, but terrorism as simply one of the problems they must deal with particularly, uh, in particular in their relationship with the, with the Arab world. What did they achieve? They would say that they got out of a hostage crisis, that they can get on with their policies in North Africa and the Middle East, that all of the French citizens are home tonight. In fact, the government is being, being praised by the, the French citizens uh, for the fact that uh, there are, they say 22, we tend to count differently depending on which hostages we're talking about, 18, but they say there are 22 hostages still being held. None of them are French. Uh, that is an achievement. When it comes to getting hostages out, as opposed to our notion, however noble it may be, of a united front, the fact is it tends to be every nation for itself. Yeah. If you were having to defend American policy tonight to, because you helped to make it for a while, uh, to the families of American hostages who must be hearing and reading about the French coming out, uh, what would you say if they asked you, can't we learn something from the French experience? Well, I, th I think the, the problem for the United States always has been to, on the one hand, be willing to talk to anybody about getting the hostages out, being open to any kind of communications. And I assume that is still the policy of this administration. It certainly was of the last one. But to do it in such a way that we don't set a precedent that the United States is willing to pay some price, whatever that is, to get its citizens out. Because we have argued, not that it's so much a moral issue, although I think kidnapping is morally repugnant, but that there is a precedential problem. If American citizens can be taken prisoner, hostage, anywhere in the world, and we are then prepared to deal with the holders of those citizens, there's no way you can stop it. There's no way it will end. At what point do you finally say, that's enough, we won't let arms go, we won't send weapons, we won't send money. So it's, it isn't so much it seems to me based on a moral issue, although I'm perfectly prepared to defend it morally, as it is based on a pragmatic... But Mr. Jenkins, why don't the French view? see it that way? Why aren't they worried about the presidential problem? And why do they see it more pragmatically? And could the United States see it that way too? Well, uh, if, I were to, if I were to invent here uh, or to try to play the role of the hypothetical Frenchman, uh, we, I, I would say that uh, the United States 
first declared its policy of no concessions in 1973. Uh, it has tried with some lapses to adhere to that policy for the past 17, 18 years. Uh, during those 18 years, American citizens around the world uh, continue to be the targets of terrorism and continue to have been taken hostage by various terrorist groups in the world. So insofar as establishing a precedent, or on the other hand, establishing a principle of deterrence, which is supposed to dissuade terrorists from taking uh, American citizens hostage, they would say it doesn't appear to have worked very well. Insofar as our admonition uh, that by giving in, you invite further hostage taking, they would say they cut deals. And, 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 and I agree entirely with Ambassador Bremer. In this particular case, we can talk about broader French objectives, but in previous cases, and potentially in this one as well, there is no question that they have in the past cut deals to get hostages out. Wow. Uh, they would say they got their citizens out and more citizens have not been taken hostage. They got through it. Okay. Well, Mr. Jenkins and Mr. Bremer, thank you both for joining us again. Jim?